a lot of introduction on this one. I just want to launch into it because I feel like this is uh, an important topic and a lot to speak about. But as you, you can see by the, t- the title, Grace at Works, um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So what this passage teaches us is that without God's grace in our lives, we would not know him. Because as you see in the book of Genesis, a couple of chapters, a couple of generations after Adam and Eve were on the earth and sin came into the world, the Bible records that the Lord saw the wickedness of man, which was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it goes on to say, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. I don't think we're any better than they were back then. And I don't know about you, the Bible says uh, that this wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. It sure sounds like today. It sure sounds like the things that I see in the news and that I read about and I watch. So this passage describes the, the uh, state of the earth before Noah's flood. Some people say, oh, well, things are so bad, it means that Jesus is going to return soon. But I don't think so. I think that what it means is, is that the church needs to get its act together. And when the church has revival inside the church, then there will be awakening. Then there will be an outpouring of the Spirit of God on people who do not know Jesus. But until then, we should pray for revival. We should pray that God would have mercy on this sin-sick world. Now, today I'm going to talk about grace and works, because grace and works are often a topic that get talked about, but they're important because they get confused. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, it, he writes, for the fullness of we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. The Greek word for grace is charis. Charis is the divine influence upon the human heart and how it is lived out in the life. It also means gift or grace or joy or liberality or or pleasure. In our English word, charismatic comes from it. One um, Bible scholar, William Moffat, wrote, Charis could be applied to that which awakens pleasure or secures joy. In other words, in ancient time, let's just pretend you went to the chariot race and the entertainment of that contest was very pleasing to you to watch. You might say that the chariot races had charis, or grace, because they caused you joy. What rejoiced men was charis. And we see this modern word grace, how we use it. A person who is marked by grace is considered elegant and lovely. And when we see someone who is a beautiful dancer, we say they're graceful. When we think of someone who is, who is, um, uh, who is favored and blessed, we say they're graced. When someone does something that's bad or dishonors themselves, then they're disgraced. And so you see how this this word grace keeps coming up within the English language. Grace is something that brings happiness and satisfaction and something that is beautiful. Grace is God's goodness, which must be accepted. 
One author has said that God's grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is not logical. Grace, many times, is scandalous because we see God extending it to people, like I am, who don't deserve it. Grace is an expression of God's love. It's an expression of his favor. Not because we are so lovely, but because he is loving. Not because we are deserving of it, but because of his kindness and his mercy and his goodness. It is his good pleasure to bestow upon us this expression of his nature. It is compassion. So Paul writes in this passage, by grace you have been saved. And he is communicating to us, his readers, that God has given us something that we could not get for ourselves. Notice I said that the word chorus is sometimes rendered gift. The apostle Paul reiterates that giftedness in this passage when he says, By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, since this relationship is a gift, like any other gift, it has to be received. It has to be accepted. In law, we say that there are three things that make up a gift. Intent, delivery, and acceptance. If, um, if, you, uh, if you don't have the intent to make a gift, then it's not a gift. If the donor doesn't deliver the gift to you, then the gift is not effective. And if you don't receive the gift, the gift is not completed. But the gift of God, which is shown in John 3, is... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God set out not just to save the Israelites, not just the Jews from their enemies, but also all of us from the bondage of sin. Jesus delivered the gift So that's the intent of God that was expressed. Jesus delivered the gift when he came, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, gave his life as a sacrifice for ours, and purchased our salvation. When I first started, I read the passage, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. What was in the Old Testament were types and pictures of this grace. And what we see in the New Testament is all of that fulfilled in the flesh by John coming. I'm sorry, by Jesus coming. And the purpose of Jesus coming, he tells us in John 17, is that we may know God the one true God, and Jesus whom he had sent. Now we begin this relationship of knowing him, not because we deserve it, but because of his good pleasure. And so the intent was described, the delivery was when Jesus came, and now we see that the gift must be received. And the passage tells us that we must receive the gift by faith. And and isn't it interesting that God not only gives us the opportunity, the gift of this relationship with him, but he also gives us the faith to accept it. God is so much better and greater and kinder and loving than we ever could imagine or think. But still... We always should try to know him better. We always should try to understand what he is saying to us in his word. And so we we come to this passage in Ephesians chapter 2 when it talks about the grace of God. 
And to me, it's just astounding because I don't deserve it. And none of us does. God has given us an opportunity to have a personal, ongoing relationship with Him. And through His Son, Jesus Christ, He's offered it to us. The question of life is, what do you do with the offer? What do you do with the offer? The intent is clear. The delivery is clear. But what will we do with it? You know, most people, when they're given a gift, they don't reach into their pocket and take out the wallet and say, so how much was this? Let me pay you for it. They're gracious, and they're gladly receiving the gift, and they tear open the paper if it's wrapped, or they dig into the bag that the gift is delivered in. We know how to accept gifts on our birthday or at Christmas or our anniversary. How is it that accepting the grace of God is such a difficult thing? I really don't quite understand it. It is just an easy fact that we must exercise our faith. Now, grace is sometimes, this passage is sometimes misunderstood because grace is what gets us our relationship with the Lord. He is the one who initiates and he is the one who brings us this opportunity for this relationship with him. And but, he also, but it also says in this passage, going on, we're going to talk about, that we are to do good works. And one of the things that led to the Protestant Reformation was this dispute between some of the people, the reformers of their day, who said, you people are talking too much about works. I have to do this and to do that and to not do this and to not do that. And if I can get all those do's and don'ts together, then you're saying that I'll be acceptable to God. And they even had a, a, a practice of if you didn't do all the do's and don'ts like you were supposed to do, you could buy your way out. They were called indulgences. It was one of the things that Martin Luther reacted to and some of the other re- early reformers reacted to. So they came up with these things and they said, these, these slogans, so sola gracia. Only by grace do we receive salvation. Sole fide, only by faith do we accept it. Sole, sole Christos, only by Jesus Christ do we have this relationship, right? Um, sola Scriptura, only through the Scriptures can we know God. And that is the only source of our doctrine and our understanding. And sola gloria Sola Deo Gloria, which means everything is for the glory of God, not for the glory of men, not for the glory of church. Okay, so they got this Sola thing going on, and yet when they get this Sola Gracia thing going, trying to combat this heresy, they're missing the second part of this passage which says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. God wants you to receive the gift of salvation by grace. He wants you to see that it is something through faith that you appropriate because he's offered it to you as a gift. But he's offered it to us so that we can do good works. We are his workmanship. That word workmanship is something that he made. Um, And the works that he wants us to do, he's even prepared for us to do beforehand. The universe and all that is in it, and especially the people that God has made, are amazing. I don't know about you, but do you ever go out when you're away from the city on a clear night like we had last night and you look into the stars and you can agree very, very easily with the psalmist who says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth the work of his hands. 
The universe reflects God's greatness and His majesty, His power, His justice and order. And we are to reflect His character as well. And we reflect His character partially through the good works that we do. Work is, you know, we know what work is, right? It's, it's a do thing. It, it's an erg. Okay, the Greek word here is ergon. Uh, the, an erg in chemistry and in physics is the ability to move something. Okay, and we talk about um, something that's ergonomically uh, designed. That means it makes the work easier. But the... But we are to do the good works. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, just as the universe with all of its beauty and majesty, just as a mountain scene or the sunrise over the beach or the waves crashing on the shore or even the lightning and the thunder that we see, just as all these things speak of God's power and majesty and might and, and bring glory to Him, so our lives are supposed to bring glory to Him too. And our lives through the things that we do. And it's not just any old work, it's the good works that we're supposed to do. When John the Baptist was in prison, he, he sent disciples to Jesus to ask Him, excuse me, are you the expected one? And Jesus said, Go and tell and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus just gave us a catalog of his good works. And then in Matthew 25, when he's sharing about what it means to be acceptable to him at the end of the age, he says, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And he goes on to say that those who don't do those good works are accursed. So this, this, these passages show us a type of work that Jesus did and the type of work that he wants us as his followers to do. Yes, it's important for us to have orthodoxy. That means correct doctrine, correct teaching. Okay, that's good. But it's also important for us to have orthopraxy, which is good deeds or good works or good acts. Because... He created us for these good works. For the feeding the hungry and giving drink to the thirsty and inviting the stranger in and clothing the naked and visiting the sick and those who are in prison. These are the things He wants us to do. Do I do these things? Not like I should. Do we as a church body do these things? Not very much. And so as I am studying this passage and I'm going through this and I'm trying to say what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to preach on, all of a sudden it's like a big light goes off in my mind. We do not well because we do not do many of the things that Jesus tells us we should do. Now, I'm not saying we should all try to run out and do everything that he's, he's put in his little list, and I'm sure, by the way, that that list is not exhaustive. We in the law have a term, we call it a justum generis, and that means that when you have a list of things, it's not only the things that are in the list, but it's also things that are like the things that are on the list. Well, I think that's that kind of list is, that is here. Why... Does a church not do these things? Well, I think it makes us uncomfortable. I don't know about you, 
But it makes me sometimes uncomfortable. And by the way, it's, it's, it's not just us. It's many, many churches in America. Jesus' call on our lives is a radical one. He calls us to die to ourselves. And, you know, that dying to yourself kind of thing, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't kind of preach real well. Because it means that you're not supposed to do the things that you want to do. It's to do the things that you ought to do. It's to do the things that He commands us to do. You know, and, you know, and then people will say, well, you know, I don't want to go overboard about this Christianity stuff. But what is it about dying to yourself or dying to myself that we don't understand? We don't do it, though, because it's impossible. Because our selfish, sinful self still keeps crawling around. Crawling off the altar when we offer ourselves. So instead of doing the dying to self things, we do the churchy things. You know, we go to meetings, we come to a service, we sing some songs, we pay our tithes and offerings. We are moral. We don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't go with them to do... But that's not what God calls us to do. He calls us to have a heart of compassion. These people who were naked and sick and in prison, they're helpless. If they could do better, they'd do better, but they're not. And they can't. You know, we have been without a pastor now for about five years. And and I must confess to you, ladies and gentlemen, both you online and those here, I sometimes am beginning to have some second doubts. You know, maybe this eldership thing is not really all that great, because I know I'm not all that great. I'm not. And so what we have is this situation where, well, it's a danger. You know, when you, when you have a paid person who's your, your chief pastor, it's a danger. Because now the paid pastor can't, teach the truth because if he upset somebody who's a big giver, then that person withholds the funds that they might otherwise give to the church. And after all, he's going to have a mortgage payment. He may have, he has kids. He's going to have, you know, private school tuition for his kids. He's got car payments. He, it sort of co-ops and compromises a person. And we're just plain Selfish. We would rather live our complaining, gossiping, promiscuous, profligate lifestyles than sacrifice ourselves for the cause of Christ. I mean, after all, it's my hard-earned money. You know, well, who gave you the ability to earn it? We have this illusion of control. Our churches are dysfunctional and we don't see the good works that Jesus said we should do. And I'm not excusing us. And I'm not to say that we, it's not to say that we never did it. I mean, that's where we met Steve many years ago. He was working at Shepherd's Way. We used to have a one night a week. We'd have homeless families come here. We'd take their kids and put them in a program for them. It was great. The parents would get in a parenting class or a budgeting class or something like that. We'd feed them a meal. We'd love on them. It was wonderful. But when they got highfalutin and they became Hope South Florida, they pulled the rug out out from underneath us. And instead of pursuing it and doing something and saying, well, we want to be a part of this, we just let it go. We've had Final Friday. We're not doing that anymore. We've had evangelistic outreaches. We're not doing those so much anymore. Beloved, There's lots of things that churches do. They have mobile showers. They have tutoring after class, after school for classes. They have babysitting services. They, they, um, they do any number of things. They, they, I know that Amanda is attending a church in London, England. They have a thing called Love Their Neighbor, Love Thy Neighbor, and they have these practical things where they make up food baskets and and baskets of things that people need, and they give them out for free. Why? Because they want to get people in the church? No, because Jesus said, do this stuff. Jesus said, do this stuff. How come we're not doing the stuff, beloved? I think we should start doing the stuff again. 
Is there anybody who wants to do this stuff again? Yeah, I think we should. I mean, we need to stop just sitting around and thinking, oh, well, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, how many people here? Uh, we don't have that many people. Yeah, wah, as Jay says. Look it. I'll tell you a story. I was in uh, Greece a few years ago, and I, I have a friend who runs an international ministry, and I called him up and I said, hey, Rob, do you have any ministries in Greece that you could direct us to? He said, well, let me check on that. And he comes back to me and says, how about the Salvation Army? I said, the Salvation Army, really? That's who your connection is? So we go. My kids and I go to the Salvation Army in Athens. And, um, and we get there. There's a big, long line of Syrian refugees standing outside the Salvation Army. So it's a distribution center. And we come up and we said, okay, we're here to work. They said, we got nothing for you to do. So, well, didn't you, you know, we called and we said we were coming. They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what we want you to do. We want you to go downstairs in the basement and we want you to organize all that stuff down there. Okay, so we did it. And at first we grumbled a little bit, but, you know, we knew that what we would do would be supporting what they were doing upstairs. So we went down there and we did it. And we, man... We organized it good. They even said, you guys can come back. You're not like the other volunteers we have, just kind of sit around and do nothing. You actually worked and you actually did something that was practical help to us, and you can come back anytime. So they took us to lunch after that. We went back to the Salvation Army, and they had some refreshments there for us. And I said, how did you guys get involved in this Syrian refugee relief? They said, you know, our church was kind of faltering our church was kind of losing attendance. There was no joy. And, and we were just sitting around praying one day, and we said, Lord, just give us something to do for you. Just how can, we, how can we re-energize our people? How can we get everybody enthusiastic again about the gospel? Would you do something for us, Lord? And, and within a, co- a couple of days, they got a call from the government. We need help. We have all these Syrian refugees, and we don't have anybody to help us with them. Would you help us with them? You help them give some food and clothes and, and baby supplies and hygiene supplies and all this stuff. She said, we didn't have any money. We didn't have anything. She said, okay, well, we're part of it. We'll be part of it. So they're praying, you know, Lord, what are you going to do? The Catholic bishop calls up. We have a big program going on. We don't have time to send a lot of volunteers. But we have $100,000 we're going to give you. So would you just administer that for us? So she said they went and they bought all these supplies wholesale. And they, and, and, and they put the word out of all their people. And their people talked to their neighbors. And She said there they are 30 days later. It's like 12.30 in the morning. And everybody is having a great time. They're packing the baskets and they're singing songs and they're laughing and they're telling jokes. And, and she says, I looked around and that was the church that we were hoping for. That was how God brought us together because we were feeding the hungry and we were clothing the naked and we were doing what he called us to do. Good works are important. If we just sit around and talk about good works, or we just sit around and have a holy huddle and don't do anything, God's not real thrilled about that. So you know you may say, well, that's not my thing. Okay? That's not my thing. I, I, I really don't feel very qualified to do that. I mean, I'm busy and i got all this other stuff. Well, that's kind of like what Moses said when God called him. Moses, God goes out of his way to burn this bush so that Moses would come aside and look. And he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to tell the, get the children of Israel out of there. I want, I want to do some stuff. And Moses says, not me. I'm not qualified to do that. I can't talk. I'm no good at that. Someone wisely said, God doesn't 
called qualified. He qualifies the called. And so we have to recognize that the call of God is there. Because at the end of the age, we're going to stand before Jesus and we're going to say to Him, Do I go to the right or the left, Lord? And if we fed the hungry, and if we clothed the naked, maybe we'll hear something good from the Lord. In, in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 8, it says, But now, O Lord, You are our Father. We are the clay, and You are the potter. And all of us are the work of Your hand. I think we need to place ourselves in the potter's hand again. I think we may have gotten a little crusty around the edges. We may have gotten a little dried out. And that's not the way the Lord wants us to be. The Lord wants us to be energized. You know, we have this blessing box thing downstairs. We have this couple that came and they were all fired up about it and, and they've moved on to another church. And, but we have this blessing box ministry. We don't have anybody to take it over at this point. I mean, I maybe we've got some people that are interested in it, but we need some help with that. We need some people who can greet. George says he needs some more people so he can, so he can do a better job of greeting people. But we need to come together. We need to brainstorm about this thing. We need to say, maybe what we need to start with is a Steve and how we can love his families better and how we can help clothe them and feed them and all those kinds of things. But we need to do more than just minister to the people that we have already here. We need to minister to those people who, like us, could never pay back what God has done for us. We could never pay back what God has done for us. And we need to minister to the people who can't pay us back. Because, beloved, the Lord says that He has ordained that we walk in the good works. You know, I, I was thinking of this sermon and I, and I was thinking of Star Wars. The first Star Wars movie where, where there's a little R2-D2 and there's something stuck in here and psh, all of a sudden here comes this image up, you know, and it's Princess Leia and she's saying, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. I think the only hope of the church is to do the good works that Jesus says are good works. And I think we need to be about that. I want to apologize to you that I've been such a crummy leader in this area. And I want to join with you. Because I believe that we can and should see this like that Salvation Army. Filled with people having a great time. Ministering needs of people that were real who could do nothing to pay it back. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who can become His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Beloved, I am going to challenge you. Let's walk in the works that God has prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in. And let us gather and dream and plan and pray about how God may use us as a church body. Let's not give up, but let's give out. Let's go on. Grace saves us, but it also calls us to work we're not saved by the works. No, no. But we are saved to work. And I think we should get after it. What about you? Uh, praise team's going to come and...
we're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask Jim if he'd do the invitation and pray with anybody who wants to come forward and dedicate themselves to greater works of the Lord um, because I don't have my little girl to play piano this morning while I do that. So let's pray.